Good evening. Welcome. We're very glad that we're able to have a, a brief teaching time this evening, even though we're, again, not able to be here in person. Uh, we're continuing to play the situations out day by day and even week by week, and none of us know exactly how long this is going to last. But everybody here on staff at Community Baptist Church, we all miss you very much as our church family, and we're all looking forward very much to the time when we can all come back together. Right now, Pastor Joe and his family are down in North Carolina. Becky's dad, Tom Farrell, is having brain surgery tomorrow, and we love Brother Farrell, and he's been here many times. So I want to encourage you all to continue to keep him and his family, Pastor Joe's family, in prayer, along with Beth and Ben Farrell as Tom's oldest son. Uh, keep them in prayer, and obviously Brother Tom and Regina as they face this uh, uh, trial tomorrow. Um, but while Pastor Joe is away, he asked that for the foreseeable future at least, um, I plan on taking Wednesday nights and lead the church through a short Bible study um, over the next several weeks. And so we're going to be in the book of 1 Timothy this evening, so let me encourage you, if you have a copy of the scriptures, and I hope that you do, um, please go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Timothy, and we're going to be in chapter number 3, and we're going to look at verses 14 through 16. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verses 14 through 16. We'll take our time and look at this over the course of several weeks, and we'll really take it phrase by phrase. This week will be something of an introduction to the main content that I'd like to get to. Um, and I, I'm excited about this passage of Scripture. I think that there's quite a bit here for us. Um, uh, but the main uh, meat, I guess if you could say, of the series that we're going to be looking at begins in verse number 16 of 1 Timothy 3. And this, according to many scholars, could be one of the actual earliest Christian hymns that we have. Uh, the poetic nature of it leads many scholars to conclude that the phrases that we see in succession in verse number 16 are actually the lines and stanzas of uh, an ancient, probably, hymn or creed, a very early confession that was well known among the churches that Paul's actually quoting here. And so we want to look at that. Um, what the church sings is always manifestly important because it reveals the theological character of the church of the time. You can tell what was going on in the life of a church and an assembly of a church by what they sing. And very often, eras of church history are marked by uh, songs that emphasize various theological truths. The issues of the day are often reflected in the singing and the songs of God's people in the churches and the churches they gather with. So we're going to be looking at this passage of Scripture, and we're going to begin with verse number 14. But before we do, let's open up with a word of prayer this evening. Our gracious Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to gather, and even though it is uh, across many uh, uh, geographical locations, we're grateful that um, this is temporary, Lord. We're looking forward to being back together, and we trust by your grace that we will gather again together, and you've commanded us to. And Lord, though we have to separate for a short time, Lord, this makes us the more anxious and the more thankful for the fellowship that we have with each other. I pray, Father, that as we look at your scriptures tonight, that you would open up our eyes and that the Holy Spirit would do a work to um, encourage us, strengthen us, rebuke us, Father, as you know uh, that we need. We love you, God, and we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. As we look at the book of 1 Timothy, this is an epistle that Paul is writing to um, a young friend of his, one who is a close travel associate, and I'm sure many of you are familiar somewhat with Timothy, that he was a convert of the Apostle Paul, um, and he was, again, a close associate, one who traveled with Paul in his journeys, and one that actually, although apparently very different in his disposition and personality than Paul, was one that Paul trusted implicitly with his own ministry and his own ministry objectives. And we see this because of the fact that Paul very often would send Timothy to be with various churches and help in the affairs there. Paul specifically sent Timothy to the city of Corinth to help establish the church there and work through the many issues that that church was facing. And even when Paul himself was not able to be present, he found that Timothy was a wonderful associate who would take the interests of the Apostle Paul and represent those interests to the people. And in the book of 1 Timothy here, this epistle that Paul is writing to his pastor friend, he's writing to Timothy while Timothy is staying for a while at the church of Ephesus. Now, it's important to understand that at this time, Timothy is not the pastor of the church of Ephesus. He is certainly serving a pastoral role. He is representing Paul to the people, but this church had been established and elders had already been ordained for the church at Ephesus. 
However, Paul was anticipating and indeed had received some reports of difficulties and trouble, specifically in the teaching there at Ephesus. And so he sent Timothy to kind of help oversee and be kind of a point man for the Apostle Paul, carrying some of that tempor uh, temporary apostolic authority with him to kind of organize public affairs such as gathered worship, preaching, teaching, and overseeing the affairs of the church in a, in a kind of temporary capacity in order to aid Paul in that way. And Paul is writing to help Timothy as he tries to accomplish this mission. And there are certain things that Paul wants to point out. In this passage of Scripture, though, as we begin to read it, what we're going to see is that Paul is going to describe to Timothy a bit of the relationship that exists between the church and the truth. And these two things are very interdependent. Um, as we're going to see, they, they help each other, they complement each other, and Paul's going to describe exactly what that relationship is between the church and the truth. So I hope you have your scriptures. Look at 1 Timothy 3, and uh, verse number 14, we'll begin reading there. Paul says this, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Tonight, we're really going to focus on verses 14 and 15 as kind of the prologue to this hymn that Paul quotes in this passage here. And so let's first of all look at um, Paul's presence and teaching uh, that he's providing to Timothy here. So first thing in verse number 14, Paul writes really his purpose, what he's trying to accomplish with this letter. And he's saying, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave. So the first thing here we see is um, Paul's uh, delegation of uh, authority and really a responsibility to Timothy to pass on certain things. Now, even though Timothy is not a full-time, long-term pastor of the church, Timothy is functioning in a pastoral role. And here in verse number 14, we see the purpose of the entire book. And that is that Timothy would take certain things from Paul um, that Paul's entrusting to him, and these things Timothy would then pass on to the people. Part of Timothy's responsibility as a functioning pastor, as an elder, is to pass on and teach the information that Paul gives to him. The pastor's job is to teach the congregation. And we see this played out um, in others of Paul's writings, and specifically in the second epistle that Paul writes to Timothy in verse uh, chapter number four, verse number two, Paul writes, and this is a very familiar passage, but Paul writes, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded and your suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. In this passage of Scripture, Paul is pointing out to Timothy that there is a constant need for pastoral instruction of the word to the people. He specifically says that the preaching of the word is to be happening in season and out of season. In other words, you are to be preaching consistently, Timothy pastor, regardless of whether or not people enjoy the preaching and teaching or not. Preaching and teaching is something that there is always a constant need of, no matter the cultural climate, no matter the spiritual temperature of the people that you are ministering to, preaching must always occur. This is the doctrinal responsibility of the pastor. The pastor does not exist to serve the needs and interests of the congregation as though the pastor provides a commodity at an enterprise, as though the pastor is selling a product 
at a store. The church members do not come to the church in order to get the stuff that the pastor is selling them. Because then, in a sense, the pastor works for the congregation. He provides what the congregation wants or perceives that they need. But the truth is much greater than that. The pastor doesn't work for the congregation. The pastor works for God and so has a responsibility on him to preach, not his own word, but God's. There is a doctrinal weight and responsibility that is inherent to Timothy's responsibility as an elder. For Timothy to be a good pastor, he must be one who takes the apostolic teachings about the gospel and consistently puts them in front of the people of God. 1 Timothy 1.10, earlier in the same book, we see the similar concept. Verse, uh, number, uh, verse number 3, he says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. So this is the beginning of the book. Paul is saying, remain there in the city so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. This is an incredibly key passage for us to understand what the role is of the pastor within the church of God. In 2 Timothy, we saw that injunction on Timothy to preach the word. There's the positive command for Timothy to consistently put forward sound doctrine to the people. This is accompanied by reproof, to, to correct, uh, to instruct all of these things so that people would be complete and whole. Here in 1 Timothy, we see the negative side of that. Timothy himself is to preach sound doctrine. However, he is also specifically to rebuke false doctrine and the people who want to teach it. There's always, as there is always a need for sound doctrine to be taught and preached from the pulpit of every church, so then there is always a danger for unsound doctrine to be generating within a church. We are always in danger of moving astray theologically. And this is a danger we ought always to take to heart because it's very possible, according to verse number six of chapter number one, to be very, very confident in our assertions about the nature of theology. Six and seven says this again. Certain persons by swerving from a good conscience and sincere faith, or excuse me, certain persons by swerving from these have wandered into vain discussions. And what's the problem is that they really think that they know something particular to be true about theology and they are confident in their assertions. However, they have swerved from the path of true doctrine. Now, what Paul is saying here is not that Christians who are not pastors should never teach anything to anybody lest they wander into unsound doctrine. It's not the point that Paul is making. We know from the scriptures that we are to be teachers. And in fact, Paul says he wishes that all would be teachers um, instead of uh, many of the other gifts. There is a responsibility laid on Christians to be teachers in some capacity. However, we understand also that not all of us are gifted to serve that as the primary function in the local church. We're all called to share the gospel, and that's a form of teaching. We're all called to exhort and edify one another, and that's a form of teaching as we point people to the truth of God's word. However, God has also gifted certain people to proclaim sound doctrine to the church regularly. These are people that the church recognizes with this gift and calls out to be pastors. And these people have the responsibility to both present sound doctrine and rebuke heretical doctrine whenever it comes up. And so we need to understand that theology carries the greatest responsibility. It carries a huge weight to it because there is always a danger inside our own hearts to actually go astray theologically. And the super interesting thing here is that doctrine or theology is linked perfectly, related inseparably to right application of the doctrine. 
Look again at verse number five of 1 Timothy chapter number one. Now, Paul says that he is to, that Timothy is to rebuke those who are teaching any different doctrine. And what's the purpose of rebuking heretical doctrine and teaching sound doctrine? What's the purpose? Verse number five, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. And how is it that people very often get led astray to heretical doctrine? They swerve and have wandered into vain discussions. Brothers and sisters, very often in our minds, we tend to pit theology and practical Christian living. And some of us very often tend towards one or the other. Some of us love reading books of theology that really get uh, really into the, the depths of uh, the mysteries of God and work to try and understand all that the scriptures have said. Other of us really prefer to read things that are devotional and draw our minds to a greater love and affection of God. But brothers and sisters, these two are not enemies. Rather, they both promote the other. True theology that is done correctly always leads to greater holiness and affection in a person's life. And a person who truly loves God is going to then look at the scriptures and say, I want to understand this God as fully as I possibly can, as much as he has revealed himself. Brothers and sisters, very often we try and take one or the other without realizing that the scriptures themselves always link these two together. The idea of a theology that is divorced from practical living is 100% foreign to the New Testament writers. Paul could not possibly conceive of doctrinal depth and clarity apart from holy living and affection towards God. And likewise, there is never a scenario where there are mere exhortations that are not accompanied by the truth about Jesus and the gospel and the nature of God in Revelation that motivate or provide the foundation for this practical living. Now, what we see implicitly in Timothy's responsibility to preach the truth and rebuke heretical doctrine is then the church's responsibility to receive this teaching. Paul is not writing specifically just so that Timothy knows how he ought to behave. Paul is not writing for Timothy just so Timothy has an idea of how church should work and nobody else, as though Timothy is part of some secret club that keeps all the good secrets and all the, the good knowledge for himself, and then he kind of doles it out piecemeal. No, the truth is that although Paul is writing to Timothy, he's writing to Timothy for the church. Timothy's responsibility was never to keep the truth, but rather that the truth would be proclaimed, which means, brothers and sisters, that as the pastor preaches and teaches theologically, it is the congregation's responsibility both to believe, work to understand, and then live out that theology in a proper way. Brothers and sisters, we have more resources than we ever have had in any point in church history that give us access to the best research into the theology of the scriptures. We have websites, we have books in abundance. If you need any suggestions, come talk to me or come talk to Pastor Joe. We would love to point you in directions. I have got quite a few books in my library, Pastor Joe does as well, but what we possess physically is nothing compared to the absolute wealth of biblical exposition, systematic theology, biblical theology, devotional and practical help in living that is available to any Christian living in the United States. Let me encourage you to begin a journey that pursues a combination of theological knowledge and practical devotional living. Brothers and sisters, you may say, well, I have been saved for 40 or 50 years. But let me remind you again that there is always a danger because of the sin in our hearts for us to deviate from the truth. We're always in need of sound doctrine. Let me encourage you, brothers and sisters, to go deeper than you have before. If you say, well, I've read everything, you know, that I've been recommended in the past, and I feel like I've got a pretty good handle on it. Let me encourage you to push yourself a little bit farther. Maybe you say, I have no idea where to start. I've never even thought about reading or trying to grow in my understanding of theology. I've just been reading a chapter a day. That's wonderful. We're glad that you're doing that. Let me encourage you. Push yourself a little bit farther. 
Come talk to me again. I would love to recommend things that are, that are easy to, uh, to get into, things that will help uh, give you categories of thought and help you take the first steps on your theological journey. But brothers and sisters, what we need to understand is that theology is not something that uh, is, is merely for the intellectual to pursue for their leisure. It's not merely something for pastors that's good for them to know, but not really necessary for anybody else. Because all that theology is, is to take the scriptures which God himself has revealed and work to understand what these truths are and then how they relate to other truths in scriptures. We work to do this as we systematize truths like this. We call it systematic theology. We work to understand what the truths of Scripture are and then how they relate to all the other truths of Scripture as a cohesive unit. And brothers and sisters, good theology, when it is done correctly, always leads us to deeper worship of God, a greater affection for Him, and greater holiness in our lives. That is why theology is not just for pastors. And theology is not just uh, for the intellectual. God has given all of the Scriptures to all of the church. And on that basis, it is all of the church's responsibility to pursue to the best of their ability to understand all of the scriptures. To say that you don't need doctrine, ultimately, is to say that part of God's word is, not, is insufficient for you. You are effectively saying that there are parts of Scripture that you don't need when you claim with some air of piety that you uh, have no need of theology. Very often we almost get this kind of uh, uh, idea that it is a good work to avoid theology because all I need to do is just read the Bible and love Jesus. And brothers and sisters, while we definitely work to grow in our knowledge and love of Jesus, it is the height of arrogance to ignore the theological depth of Scripture because that is to say, God, you gave me too much. I don't need all that you gave me. But brothers and sisters, we believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and that all of the Scriptures are necessary for our sanctification. Brothers and sisters, in the same way that we cannot physically grow and be healthy living on a diet of one particular food group alone, in the same way, we cannot grow spiritually on one particular kind of truth in the scriptures. We cannot grow exclusively on theology, nor can we grow exclusively on the practical applications and commands that flow from it. Brothers and sisters, what category do you tend to fall in? What does your personality tend to lead you to? And let me encourage you to be balanced. Theology, practical Christian living must go together. They are completely inseparable. And so we see not only Timothy's responsibility as an elder to promote sound doctrine and reject unsound doctrine, we also see the church's responsibility to imbibe this doctrine, to take it, learn it, understand it, and then live it. What are some of the things that Paul actually points out in this passage of Scripture? We see both, again, doctrine and practical Christian living. He says things in chapter 1 along the lines of don't let people teach you pointless things or deviant theology. There's a command. He also gives us theology in verses 8 through 11 of chapter 1 when he says that the law is good for the purpose of serving theology, the gospel, and holy living. We see this all the way through this entire epistle to Timothy. Now, with that being said, with that foundation being laid, let's actually now look at this combination of doctrine and practical Christian living in verse number 15. First of all, we see the doctrine that drives this purpose. Remember, Paul's purpose in this is that he's writing these things so that a person would know how to behave. Living comes from the knowing. Paul's practical applications are born directly out of his writings and his teachings. What are the teachings that give us the foundation for knowing how we ought to live? First of all is understanding the church. Paul describes the church in a couple of key ways, and we're going to look at those ways to help us lay the foundation for what's coming in this passage of Scripture. First of all, we see that the church is here described as the household of God. Look again at verse number 15. He says, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Now, this imagery is both 
uh, serving the point of an illustration, as well as being theological. And in the theological sense, Paul is using a metaphor to say that the church is God's family. And we are God's family by adoption specifically. We have been made heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Ephesians chapter number 1, verses 4 and 5 say this, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself, as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. We have been adopted into God's family. We once were outside of the family of God, having no relationship uh, that's a positive one to God. Only by the grace of God have we been adopted through the shed blood of Christ. Brothers and sisters, maybe you're listening to this and maybe you're a member of our church or maybe you just found the website and you're just watching the video. But no matter how you found this video, let me tell you the truth from God's word that all of us by nature are not part of the family of God. We're actually the enemies of God. And that actually because of the things we've done to break God's law, we require the punishment of God. And this is 100% just and fair for God to do because he is the ultimate lawgiver. He created all things. He's the one who determines the nature and purpose of mankind. We don't determine our own purpose. God is the one who has determined our purpose for us. But we have destroyed, we've marred this purpose through selfish living. And brothers and sisters, because of this, we deserve the judgment of God. It was the death of Christ his son Jesus, who was fully God, fully man, truly God, truly man. It was his death on the cross that actually took that penalty we deserve. And if we respond to that gift by faith, we can have eternal life and be adopted into the family of God. Let me encourage you to talk to someone about that, either me or Pastor Joe or someone on staff here. And if you're not sure that you're in the family of God, we would love to show you from the scriptures how you can be. So we see this adoption that we have from God into his family. And what Paul is describing here is an identity, not an institution. Again, as I mentioned before, the church is not a commodity, which I occasionally draw resources from or contribute resources to. It is not a community chest of spiritual vitality. Rather, to be part of the family of God marks the identity of which I intrinsically am a part. In other words, I don't have the option of choosing to be a Christ follower, to choose to, to follow Jesus with my life, to give him everything as Lord. I don't have the option of repenting from sin and casting myself wholly on the grace of Christ that I see at the cross and get to opt out of the family of God. In other words, church is part of the package and you can't get out of it even if you don't want it. But brothers and sisters, those who are in Christ do want it. They want to be a part of the family of God. But this is an identity which you receive. You didn't ask for it. God gave it to you. You can't get out of it. You are part of the household of God. This is who you are. This is your identity. And what is left then is not whether or not you're a part of it. What is left is how you will behave as a member of the household of God. What Paul is trying to communicate here is that his teachings are crucial not for people necessarily to choose whether or not they want to be part of the family of God as a Christian, but since they are Christians and therefore in the family of God, their behavior, their lifestyle, the things they do will either be appropriate to that household or inappropriate. I can't even tell you how many times growing up, we had certain chores that we had to do and I would ask my mom or my dad, why do I have to do this? You probably got the same answer when you were a kid. Um, and the answer was, because you're a part of this family. Exactly right. There are certain things that we did in my house just because we were a part of this family. Um, music was a big deal when I was growing up. I was required to take piano lessons. I never had a say in it. I was never asked my opinion on the subject. Um, it was just a requirement that every day I had to practice piano and my parents sacrificed and uh, I gave me the opportunity to take lessons. I'm very thankful for it now. Um, I wasn't always growing up, but the truth is that regardless of whether or not on a particular day I enjoyed piano, that had nothing to do with it. Because of my identity as a member of the household, 
certain actions were expected and even required of me. There were also certain things that for me to do in public would have been inappropriate. Now, everybody's family functions differently, and I'm not saying that one particular style is better or worse than another, but uh, for one thing in particular, there were certain things that we were not allowed to do. If there were adults at the table uh, growing up, um, as children, especially if they were guests, we were not allowed to speak. We, we waited, and we waited until we were spoken to before we spoke. And uh, I know that's probably a little bit, uh, maybe, uh, a little bit older of an idea now, but regardless, um, that's how we were raised. And uh, the idea with that not is that it's particularly moral or immoral or that one is better than another, but the idea is that for me at the dinner table to speak over an adult who was already sitting at the table and was speaking was behavior that was inappropriate for me as a member of that household. And for me to know that that was inappropriate, I had to understand what my place was within this household. In other words, if I was an adult, then I had the privilege to be able to speak, but as a child, I did not. Brothers and sisters, that's the idea that Paul has here, is that we need to know where we fit into the household of God. And to be a member of the household of God carries with it certain connotations for expected behavior. We are called to live a certain way in light of the fact that we are now a part of God's family. Brothers and sisters, God has called us to live holy lives in light of the doctrine, the theology of the church. That theology teaches us that we are not just people who attend a community gathering. We are not just people who happen to like each other and so like to hang out about once a week at 1030 on Sundays. No, our goal as believers, we gather not because of something external, but because of something internal and intrinsic that's already true. We gather because we are a family. We are the family of God. We also see that this church, this family of God, is called then the church or the ecclesia of the living God. Look at verse number 15. He says, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. And we use this term broadly. In uh, the New Testament, this, church, this word church, ecclesia, gathering, is very often used just kind of as a catch-all phrase under which we find a lot of different metaphors. However, I think that here in this passage, this particular phrase, this usage of the word church, is actually set parallel to this idea of the household of God. In other words, these two ideas, one doesn't fit under the other. They both help to inform your picture of the whole. And the idea with this is that this is the gathering of the living God. That is that when the church gathers appropriately as the household of God, God gathers with them. This is backed up by the teachings of Jesus who said specifically that where two or three are gathered, there am I in their midst. This also uh, accompanies the idea that um, the church is the temple of the living God, that we are stones. And the idea is that we are a temple which is then inhabited corporately by God himself. And though we personally, individually are temples of God, corporately, we also together make up the temple of God. And so as we understand that our relationship to each other and to God is one of family, we also understand that when we gather together that our identity as a local church, as Community Baptist Church, is a gathering where God himself is with us. We also see this last description here, that the church is the pillar and ground or buttress of the truth. Now, the relationship here is interesting because it is the word of God which creates the church. This is an important theological concept to understand that the church does not create the word of God as though a bunch of men wrote things down. The church then looked at it and said, yes, we accept this is the word of God and this we do not. The word of God is the word of God regardless, and it is actually the truth that is inherent to the scriptures, the living power that is part of what it means to be scripture that actually creates the church. And those regenerated people who hear the truth of the scriptures in the gospel, they respond in faith to Jesus Christ, and they look at that truth and they say, yes, that is from God. And so there's this mutual relationship where the word of God actually creates the church. However, 
God has promised to preserve his truth. Not one of his words will ever fail. And God has ordained that the very thing which the truth created also becomes the means of its preservation. In other words, you have the truth and it creates the church. Because as people hear the word of God and respond to the gospel by the spirit of God, God, through his spirit, creates churches out of regenerated people in every area. These people then, who are so committed to this book, to this scripture, take this word and they proclaim it and they preach it with accuracy. They work to proclaim exactly what the word says, not what they say. And in this way, God actually takes the truth that created the church and then uses the church to actually support and propagate and preserve this same truth. There's a relationship of interdependency between the word and between the church. The church's responsibility is both the care and proclamation of the truth. Again, this is why theology is 100% crucial and essential for the life of the church. It actually matters. More often than not, any time that I bring up a theological concept, somebody will ask me the question, well, okay, so what does that matter for my Christian life? Theology matters because the church's responsibility is to care for the truths of Scripture and accurately convey them to the next generation. Every applicational problem in the life of a Christian is actually at its core a doctrinal one. We live poorly as Christians because we have poorly understood the nature of the gospel and of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Every way that the modern church has strayed into one degree of worldliness or another or strayed into one degree of doctrinal heresy or another is ultimately revealing of a, of a deficiency in their doctrine. Jude writes in his epistle that, he says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary, necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude says, although I wanted to write about the gospel and just rehearse certain truths, I actually need to contend, that is, provide a polemic, provide a defense, an apology for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The church has been entrusted with the care of the truth, and therefore it is the church's responsibility both to understand and accurately proclaim it to the world. And finally, the transition that we see to this next section here. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. And here in this one phrase, the very beginning of verse number 16, we see again this marriage between application and theology. Paul is about to confess, not commands. He's about to uh, sing out not certain behaviors that are advisable for Christians. Rather, he is about to give in a beautiful, simple, phrase-by-phrase -phrase explanation and summary of the gospel truth. And for Paul, the gospel doctrines and the theology associated with it contains in seed form godliness. Godliness is a state that is granted to us by understanding and believing certain theological truths. We cannot be saved apart from theology, and theology drives godly living. So what we've seen in review is the relationship that exists between the church and the truth. That is, the church has the care of the truth, both as the gathering of God and the household of God. It accurately proclaims that truth. The goal of our church every Sunday is to present the Word of God clearly and simply through prayer, public reading of Scripture, the preaching of the Word, and songs that we sing that accurately reflect the truth in Scripture. We teach Sunday school classes, not because we're scared that uh, uh, you know, if we don't have three Bible studies on Sunday, then we're, you know, we're all going to fail as Christians, but we have Sunday school classes and adult Bible studies so that people can grow in their understanding both of the theology and the practical applicational living that is necessary for the church to accurately preserve and transmit the word of God. And as we think about these truths, brothers and sisters, let me commend you 
encourage you, exhort you to pursue to a greater degree your understanding and knowledge of the truth contained in Scripture, the doctrine, the theology, and work hard to allow that to motivate you to deeper worship and a more consistent walk with God.